God said, I will be your God. God is faithful, always keeping a promise. God said, I shall lead you beside still waters. God is faithful, always keeping a promise. God said, I will never stop forgiving you. God is faithful, always keeping a promise. God said, I love you and I shall not forsake you. God is faithful, always keeping a promise. God said, I have made you my children, now and forever. God is faithful, always keeping a promise. With these promises fresh upon our hearts, let us begin worship.
You are relentless in your desire to convince all of creation how there is no place we can go where we will be separated from your love. May these words of prayer become the conviction of our hearts. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen.
Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Before you sit down, give a little wave to somebody close by. <laughs> I want to welcome you to Cypress Creek Christian Church, a community striving to put love first in all things, helping individuals and families learn how to, to put love first. Because it can sound like a nice idea, but when it comes right down to it, it is more than challenging. I do want to lift up a couple of things. First of all, Mariah and some of our high school youth are already out at church camp. Some are leaving about right now to get there. Uh, and so we are excited for them as they, well, were not able to participate last year in church camp. So they're gathering out at Camp Gonzo as we speak. But I also want to lift up Mariah, our, our youth minister, uh, Mariah is in the middle of intensives right now. Intensives in seminary, uh, she's doing online, they have about a nine day period where basically they go to class almost all day. And then they have to read and write papers late at night. Uh, it is an intense experience. Well, last Sunday, she's in the middle of intensives. She was here Sunday morning in both of our worship services at 12.15, she went on intensives until 4.30 at 5 o'clock, she had one of the youth groups. At 6 o'clock, she had the other youth group. At 7 o'clock, she got back on in intensives and then drove 40 minutes home where she had to then study and write papers and then get on early Monday morning. Well, intensives in today, but she is out at church camp, uh, finishing up intensives, and then will immediately jump into a week of church camp. So pray for her. I love her energy. I appreciate her energy, but... Uh, I wish I had that energy. Yeah. I want to lift up that uh, next Sunday and the following Sunday, July 4th and 11th, we're having a smooth drive from Northwest Assistance Ministry. We are wanting to make ourselves a hill of beans and a mountain of macaroni. We are collecting dry beans and macaroni and cheese. If you bring some other items, that's okay as well. But we literally would like to see a hill of beans and a mountain of macaroni. So uh, next Sunday or the following Sunday, if we would bring some of those items as a donation for now. Speaking of July the 4th, we have a one service Sunday. Usually the Sunday closest to the 4th, well this year it is the 4th, uh, we do a one service Sunday at 10 a.m. and we are gonna be back in the centrum. And even though I totally skipped this at the first service, I want you to watch a short video, if they left it on after I messed it up.
that was one of the other places oh. that they have tested them. And you get to see how those work. You got to see some of the colors on the inside. There are still things that are happening that the permanent sound system probably will not yet be up and running for next Sunday, so we'll have a portable system in there. They're installing the video wall as we speak. We'll let us see whether that's ready to go or not. There'll be some trim that will still be happening and some painting here and there. But it is really quite amazing, almost four years after the fact. So to celebrate that, let me really just do a quick review. Next Sunday, how many services? One. What time? Ten. Where? Seven. I'll test you later as well. <laughs> and then also next Sunday, July 4th, we will begin our kind of VBS. We're going to be doing it on Sunday mornings this year. It will start at 9 a.m. next Sunday, and it will run for two hours. So we'll extend through the Sunday, or through the worship hour. Um, they're excited about it. We'll be having activities, and then they will do it each Sunday in July uh, back at 9 o'clock, and we will return on the second Sunday of July to two services. So just be aware of that, and uh, it'll be exciting to have that going on. Well, today is the fourth and final Sunday of uh, this series entitled Overflowing. And I'm looking at some verses from Psalm 36. It's one of those passages that is overflowing with power and beauty and meaning. And I invite you to hear these words. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your judgments are like the great deep. You save animals and humans alike, O oh Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O oh God. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. You join me in prayer. Give us a drink from the river that is filled with your delight, that is filled with the power that is found within these words of Scripture. Allow us to feast upon them and the gifts that they offer. We offer these words in the name of Christ. Amen. There are certain iconic movie lines. It doesn't matter what age you are, most everyone can name the movie. For example, if I were to say, and Toto 2, and Toto 2. I'm guessing most of you would know that movie. Uh, a young woman trying to figure out how to get home, how to get back to Kansas, and she wants to know, can her little dog go home with her? She's asking, I guess, the question, is there enough space? Is there enough room? Those are important questions that I think people ask. A friend of mine, her name is Kim, and she's both a public school teacher and an ordained minister. She's made an observation about the environment there in the school, specifically the unspoken but very real pecking order that is found among the students. Those at the top, Whatever language might be used, the cool kids, the insiders, the, the popular ones. In the minds of these young people, they view their status as both precious and finite. That's the word that Kim used. They view it as both precious and finite. What she meant by finite is the number of places in the elite category well, the number of places in the minds of those kids is limited. If a new person joins them, does that mean that one that's already there 
has to leave. And because there is that unspoken fear and anxiety, what the group does as a whole, it protects itself, keeping it just the way it is. Why is it that we so easily jump to the conclusion that there will not be enough? There won't be enough room, enough space, enough chairs, enough of, of whatever it might be. Your steadfast love, O oh Lord, extends to the heavens. How precious is your steadfast love. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They shall all feast on the abundance. The prayerful language of ancient Israel that is found in the Psalms is, is rich and powerful. And yet it's important to understand it in the larger context of the ancient Near East, where Israel existed, but there were also other nation states and tribes and peoples. And there was a constant struggle for who would stand on top, who would have bragging rights, not only for themselves, but for their god or for their gods. And so language that was used was very narrow, nationalistic, arrogant. Lots of our tribe is the best. Our way of thinking is the best. Our God or gods are the best. And since you're not one of us, we'll have to kill you. I mean, that's basically the way the approach was in that moment. And some of that thinking, some of that language sneaks into our Bibles. But was that exactly the way that God wanted us to think? Is that the way God wanted Israel to think? I mean, you think about Abraham and Sarah, who were called forth to go wherever God might show them so that they could be a blessing to all the nations. I think about a God who moved among an enslaved people in Egypt and liberated them. I think of a God who brought forth prophets to speak on behalf of the weak and the marginalized, the orphan, the widow, the foreigner among them. So to think about those revelations of God over and against this other way of thinking, it just doesn't seem to align. Why is it that we have this tendency to draw limits so easily? Reducing the number of places or seats or opportunities. 25 years ago, I am on vacation. And the reason I remember that is it was the final vacation I took right before I got married. And I'm on vacation, and I got into one of those conversations that a pastor usually doesn't like having when the pastor is on vacation. It was one of those deep religious conversations, and I just kind of wanted to get lost in a book. It all started with somebody referencing a movie, All Dogs Go to Heaven. Actually, I think it was the sequel that was to the original one of those movies. And this guy says, that's foolishness. Dogs don't go to heaven. No animal goes to heaven. Now, I probably could have just ignored what he was saying, except right past it, except there was a young girl that was overhearing this. And clearly she was sad. <laughs> I might even say a little traumatized based upon what he was saying. I'm guessing she had a few pets that had died. And yet this man just continued to say how it was nonsense to say that animals were in heaven. The Bible says that, he said. And then he said something that kind of caught my attention. He said, there would not be enough room in heaven for all the animals and for us. I then referenced the song that I just read to you, specifically the line that says, you say humans and animals alike, O oh Lord. And he seemed a little shocked. He did not know that reference. Said he'd look it up later, but uh, he imagined that it meant something else. His biggest concern, though, was where would you stop? 
If you say that all dogs go to heaven, what are you going to say next? All cats go to heaven, and all zebras, and elephants, and, and fish? I didn't convince him, but I do think I helped the young girl feel a little bit more comforted. But I took from that conversation an insight into his mindset. His view of heaven was a lot like the popular table in a lunchroom at school. There are a limited number of chairs around that table. And so if somebody new is invited, then it means somebody who's already there has to get up and leave. And there is a fear that encourages what I would call thinking small. Why is it that we think so small and draw this very narrow mindset in regard to many things in life? Especially when you, when you read this psalm, the author here, the language is full and lush and over the top. It describes not only God, but the way God interacts with us. Your steadfast love, the author writes, extends to the heavens. Well, in the ancient world, there was probably no greater way of describing something that went beyond imagination. It extends to the heavens, and clearly, it extends further than I can imagine here on earth. Your faithfulness to the clouds, your righteousness is like the mighty mountains, your judgments are like the great deep. The language here grabs our imagination, spacious imagery. You save humans and animals alike. Which I think those of us who have had pets who have gone on from this life kind of like that phrase. But in the ancient world, animals were one of two things. They were tools or they were food. And so to think that the author of the psalm says that animals and humans are of equal value. That broke every category. That was absurd thinking. But it was extraordinary thinking that God's love might actually extend in ways that we had not thought of before. How precious is your steadfast love, O Lord. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your way to all people. All People, what about the us and them, the insiders and the outsiders? And then it goes on to say, they, all people, shall feast in the, on the abundance of your house. The temple of God, they were saying, all people could come to the temple. It's our temple. We just thought it was for us. You mean they're going to show up as well? And you will give them the drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. It appears as if the author is using this beautiful, expansive rhetoric to enlarge and stretch the way many people had believed to that point. People who had a firmly established understanding of God and God's love that was very narrow and limiting. And all of a sudden, the author begins to push back those boundaries and push the way people think about God and about love. Some of you may know the author, Sandra Boynton. She writes children's books. We had a couple shelves of her books. We still have a few of them because I kind of like But one of my favorites was a book entitled, But Not the Hippopotamus. In, in the book, on the left-hand page, every time you would turn, there would be some animals coming together to do some animals you usually wouldn't put together. It says a cat and two rats are trying on hats. A mouse and a goose together have juice. That would be on the left-hand side. Every time you turn the page, but on the right-hand side would be this hippopotamus with a very sad look because it would say, but not the hippopotamus. So you can read, a cat and two rats are trying on hats, but not the hippopotamus. A mouse and a goose together have juice, but not the hippopotamus. You can just imagine reading this with a young child. They're getting into it. They know that repeating line, but not the hippopotamus. 
But as you get further into the book, there's this shift. All of a sudden, all those animals are getting together to do all kinds of things. All of a sudden, pause and turn around and see the hippopotamus, and they invite the hippopotamus to join them. And she kind of ponders for a moment, should I stay or should I go? And then you turn the page on the left side, you see this hippopotamus dancing away and saying, and yes, the hippopotamus. But on the right hand side, it says, but not the armadillo. And there's a very sad looking armadillo. <laughs> well, every time we would read that book, we would then have this conversation about how we might include the armadillo. And then I would always ask, who else? And so Zach would say, well, well, there were no fish in the story. Well, how do we include the fish? And well, how about the butterflies? And before long, we were including dinosaurs and mythical creatures and all kinds of things. And yet, at no point did my child ever say, I think we reached the limit. I don't think we can take it anymore. He never got there. And yet, somewhere along the line, as we get older, we become unwitting participants in a way of thinking that narrowly defines structures and systems and institutions in our relationships. A lot like the guy who could not fathom how he could squeeze or how God could squeeze not only all of us, but all of the animals into heaven. As if somehow this is us trying to fit 15 people into a VW bug or 11 people into a, into a phone booth. I think I just dated myself with those two illustrations. Maybe that's one of the reasons that Jesus invited us to have faith like a child. Children can always make room in their imagination. A child's mind is not limited by some of the nonsensical rules and restrictions that others try to impose. They're able to think outside of the boxes that we hold dear, and they just breeze right past them and can picture something that maybe we have forgotten. They're always asking, why can't the unicorn come? I just see Jesus kind of smiling and saying, absolutely, why not? My brother is a big animal lover, and he has currently three Great Danes, a handful of snakes and lizards and other things. But when he was at just two Great Danes, he adopted or rescued Panda. Panda is a black and white Pomeranian. She had lived most of her life in a puppy mill. Barely enough room in a tiny cage where they held her for her to even turn around. When Mark brought her into the house, she was constantly terrified. And she would often go and hide in a dark corner or find a small box and climb into it as if she had come to believe that's where she belonged. When I came to visit a couple times, Panda was doing a little bit better. But when a stranger entered the house, the, the nervousness came back. And she would run into that dark corner or find the box. But there would be these moments, these occasions, where my brother Mark and Panda would be out in the kitchen. I'd step around and just kind of peek in there. And Mark would be preparing food and Panda would be scurrying around, dancing around, so full of life and joy and enthusiasm, as if all those former restrictions that had held her down were forgotten for a few moments. I think similar things happen when someone no longer is confined by the restrictions that others have attempted to put on God and the capacity of God's love to embrace us. Why is it that Christians are so quick to speak about love, but are often the first to slap restrictions and rules and constraints and stipulations on love. I, I love the movie Aaron Brockovich. It's a movie probably many of you have seen. Aaron and Ed, the lawyer, have fought this case and they've won it and won a lot of money for those who had been poisoned basically from uh, the water that had come up from the wells that a company had put this poison in the ground. And there at the end, 
Ed is talking to Aaron about her bonus and how what they had talked about previously, well, he's been reconsidering it. And her mind immediately jumps that he's going to give her less. And he plays on it for a few moments, kind of enjoys it. Now, it's important to know that Aaron, throughout the movie, had referenced the fact that she had won early in her life Miss Wichita, a beauty pageant. And finally, she is getting so mad at Ed about him reducing her bonus, and then she opens up the check and sees that it's a whole lot more than what they had talked about, and she's kind of stunned and, and stammering. And that's when Ed has that great line. With a grin on his face, he said, do they teach beauty queens how to apologize? Because you suck at it. <laughs> now, I think I can say that word because I'm entering my 10th year here at Cypher Street. I think it would be a little bit of permission to do that. Well, I think that there are people that are looking at the church right now, and they are saying, do they teach you Christians how to love? Because some of you stink at it. The very people entrusted with the vision of God's love seem to be those who are so quick to fall back into those very narrow, limited, small understandings of love. Brian McLaren, in his book, The Great Spiritual Migration, asks an interesting question. He asks, who in the world right now is teaching love? Oh, sure, there are organizations that might be embodying love, and that's incredible, that's important. But who is teaching people how to love? Because the world around us is trying to teach something that might sound like love or might be described as love, but it falls very short of love. In fact, it does not resemble the love shown in the life of Jesus at all. And for that reason, here at Cypher Street Christian Church, we are going to be merging or uh, stretching ourselves in the months ahead. Part of what I want to do on my sabbatical is to focus more attention on this. Before the flood, I just started talking about how we at Cypher Street Christian Church were going to be a training center for the love first life. And then the flood came, and that kind of put that on hold. And then right before the pandemic, I started talking about us once again, about being a training center for the love first life. And the pandemic came. Example, we're going to get serious about it now. We're going to get serious about what faith formation means for every generation in this church, from the youngest to the oldest and everybody else in between. Because love is not something you just get by osmosis. I mean, yeah, you might brush up against it, learn a little bit, but let's be honest, when you're on that phone call with you know, customer service and you're getting nowhere, are you able to live the love first life? When you get cut off in traffic, are you living the love first life? When that person at work throws you under the bus, are you able to live the love first life? When things are falling apart in home and home, are you able to live the love first life? It's not easy. And we need to be about the work of training ourselves, working on it, understanding what conflict resolution means and how we are able to work through problems, what forgiveness looks like, but also accountability. There's so much for us to really think about as a faith community. We need to go to school. We need not only understand what love is, the radical, redemptive, and reckless love of God revealed in Jesus Christ, but how do we put such love into action on a daily, even hourly basis? I think too often today, if somebody would wander into a church, they might ask the question, Toto too? And they would get the answer, no, no, sorry, dog can't come. Or they might say, no, that person can't come. Or that group's not invited. Or those people are not welcome. And let's just be real honest. What does that say about love? What does that communicate to the world about love? We need to make sure that what we do in this place, what we do as individuals and collectively as a community, that we are portraying an understanding of love that more beautifully resembles the life of Jesus. People are desperate for that kind of love. They are desperate to encounter that kind of love. And the question is, are we just going to say, yeah, we're going to do it, without recognizing it takes work. It requires us to be a training center 
to help one another live into that. God has a human dream for us as people of faith. God has a dream for this church. And it is to become a training center, a model for what we find in 1 John where we read the love and we are to love one another because God first loved us. That model of the love first life that's seen in Jesus is the model that we are to embody if we are going to be the body of Christ in the world today. Would you join me in prayer? It is time for the work to begin. It is time for us to be schooled in the unconditional, limitless love that you, amazing God, have put on display in Jesus. It is time for us to get serious about love and to not fall into the narrow and restrictive ways of thinking that, that push out and, and leave behind so many. Take us into the classroom of your grace and mercy. Give us an education in kindness and forgiveness, compassion and generosity. You, O oh Lord, have always been about the work of bringing down the barriers that separate and exclude. You have always been about the business of expanding our perception of what love is and what love can do. Where we need to return to the classroom for a review session or where we need a crash course, be our guide, be our encourager. All we need to do is look around and we see a whole lot of training that is telling people that love isn't big enough. A love that is incapable of welcoming. A love that is used as, as a weapon. And yet that does not in any way resemble your gift, Jesus. And if we are silent about it all, we are telling a story to the world that is not true about you. So allow us to learn. Allow us to practice. Help us, even when we falter along the way, to learn from those mistakes, to grow more fully into the love that we have found in Jesus. We know that you will be our teacher and God. So let us be open. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.
The love of God is revealed in bread and cup. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds for a time of faith. I want to give a shout out to Larry who always is here filming our services. I mean, he's 
helpful during the pandemic. It just continued for years now. He has been doing this. And it, I was thinking back because I hadn't been here at Cypress Street very long. And I was in my office, and at the time the secretary says, Bruce, there's somebody here who would like to talk about the church. And I was really excited. And so I met this person, came into my office, and they had watched the previous Sunday's service that Larry had posted. And they had seen a woman presiding at the table and heard the words that all are welcome. And before I could say much, I was told that we are all going to hell. <laughs> but I was going first because I was the minister. And one of those situations where, I mean, I just kept on getting hit by it over and over again. It wouldn't get in much of a word, but I would, you know, there was no hope for me. And he just come by to let me know this. And finally, when he paused long enough to take a breath, it was one of those good moments where I was able to say, you know, we'd love for you to be in worship next Sunday, and you would be welcome at the communion table. Now, if it were left up to me, that's probably not what I would have said. <laughs> that's the reason that we say this is the Lord's table. That's right. And it is His love and grace that welcomes us together. And it's powerful. To go out into the world and to meet those that I, well, I would describe having a very narrow understanding of love, a very restrictive understanding of love that I don't believe resembles the love revealed in Jesus Christ at all. And not that we go to them and arrogantly tell them how wrong they are, but what a great opportunity to find a way, maybe just with the invitation, they come, join us. In worship, Come and participate at the table. Come and encounter the immense love of God. It's what we're called to do. We are invited to put love first in all things, not just when we're in this space. This is where it's kind of easy. But everywhere else in life. May that be our call. I invite you now, if you're able, to please stand and let us join together in our closing song.